Happy casual wine geek Wednesday. It's a wine's day. We've got wine. You, we've got you. Oh my God. Um, Thank you. We're drinking some good shit and talking about some weird stuff. I mean, it's not Hi, that Brandon. weird, but it's a little weird. Hey, that's Amanda over there. Hey, Brandon. She's over there. You're Hi. over there. Hi. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Thanks for coming today. It was a struggle. The, the struggle bus was real today. It was a... Uh, Happy Wine Wednesday. Oh, <laughs> fuck, thank God it's Wine Wednesday because <laughs> my stars are not aligned. My house is not in order. There's just some juju and this helps. Oh, uh, yeah. This helps. This helps. This helps. We, uh, we're doing Rioja today. Oh. We didn't come up with a sna- snappy title. It'll come up with itself. Okay. It'll maybe, maybe today, maybe <laughs> tomorrow. Who knows? Rioja. We're wearing blue and drinking red. I don't Wait, know. you have blue on. You have purple on. I'd say that's. I'd say you have purple on. Oh yeah, but yeah, I'm colorblind. We, so. we didn't even mat. Like we didn't call each other and say, "Hey, we're purple today." But we're very. Yeah, yeah. We're very close. Huh. Who knew? Who knew? Cheers, everyone who's listening. Thank you. Mm. Sorry, I didn't mean to just like slurp into my microphone but i mean we are drinking wine and you're listening to us so you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i'm i'm in a, i'm in a snit today that's okay do we have any biz or housekeeping or um we mailed some things off yeah whole stack of stuff if you were on the list to get things it's on its way yeah sorry about all that it's been it's been real folks it's been real <laughs> hey it's you know it just is yeah we're trying to be professional but this is a part you know labor of love it's all a learning moment it's what i'm (laughs) learning about myself and everything around me (laughs) it's all uh yeah that so we're talking about rioja today and we opened one of these a little bit early so it could breathe yeah and this is a 2005, and the only reason I wanted to talk about it on the front end of the podcast is because it's, it's from our friend Andrew. Oh, Valley Wine Merchants. Yep. Down in, in Newburgh. Down in the south. Yep. The Newburgh, south end. Oregon. And uh, I went there right after we got back from Vancouver for the oh, wine, wine yeah, festival. Oh, yeah. We went to the to the International Wine Festival. Yep. God, and that I was said, so much fun. I said, Andrew, I need more Rioja in my cellar. <laughs> <laughs> because you can lay it down forever and it only just gets better. It is amazing. It's a 2005. Yeah. Well, okay. So there's a reason that Rioja is just, well, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons. It's it's a great cellar wine. It sees a lot of oak. The rules in Rioja are different for the different classifications of the wine, which we'll talk about. I have a pyramid. There's a visual. Yeah. yeah. It's There's some maps involved. And if you are a Patreon supporter, you get all this stuff delivered right to your email inbox every week. Would you like my, I I almost said hand (laughs) highlight notes. (laughs) Yeah, you highlight them on on your little notes thing. Somebody asked, do we record on two different laptops and then mix? No. Uh, No. We record on one machine and then you have your Surface that we do all the notes on. Right. I mean, I could print my stuff out, but... But we like the environment. Well, that and I don't want to shuffle papers around and it's easier to scroll and I've got my stuff set up the way I like it. And yep. I can still look a thing up if I have a question about something that I may or may not have done my research on, which God knows sometimes it's literally minutes before I come to your <laughs> studio to record, you know, so it's. Yeah. And I appreciate it because then it's online. It doesn't disappear. We can grab it and put it on the Patreon page. And then everybody Yeah, because God it. knows I lose my handwritten notes all the goddamn time. All the time. Yeah. All, all the time. The time. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I made that grocery list 10 minutes ago, but now I can't it's, find it's it. It's somewhere. Husband, it's do you know where my keys are? <laughs> hey, where did I put my glasses? <laughs> They're literally on your head. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the dog? I don't know. It's a constant guessing game in my house. Mm. You know, it is what it is. Oh. It is what it is. What's Rio, huh? Goddamn delicious. <laughs> Sent from the good high heaven. <laughs> That's what I have to say. It's Tempranillo. Ish. And some other things, and which we'll get things. to. Okay. Um, Rioja's in northern central Spain. It's about... 
two hours drive from Bilbao. It's along a river that's called the Ebro River. Um, it's essentially a valley, kind of smaller mountain rangey situation. It's, it's in Spain. We're talking about a Spanish wine. Mm-hmm. From a particular area. Right. So it's broken up into three different areas. You've got, there's Rioja Baja, Rioja Alta, and Rioja Alavesa. Mm -hmm. Uh, Most people will just tell you that Rioja Alta and Rioja Alavesa are just better than Rioja Baja, but that's actually not always true for the most part. I mean, people will say whatever they want. Some people really love one thing, and we all know that just because everybody likes it doesn't make it good. Yeah. But sometimes that is the case. It is just good, and that's why everybody likes it. You know, soil and temperature and climate and all the things that we talk about that go into making a delicious and delightful bottle of wine are all of that. So you've got Spain, you've got Rioja, which I think is one of the most famous Spanish wines. Like, when I think of Spain, Rioja is exactly what I think of first. Yeah, I think of Rioja, and I think of... Um, what's her other favorite? Cher. <laughs> no? Is that wrong? It's not not right? <laughs> Some people would say Beyonce. They'd be wrong, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about Spain. <laughs> I don't know. It's Yes, Spain and Rioja. Uh, so you're saying what is the other Spanish wine that you think of when you think of Spain? Yeah. Are you thinking of Albarino? Maybe. We did a whole episode on Albarreño. Albarreño. Um, yay. Albarreño. Yay. Which is a great wine any time of year, but particularly in the summer because it's uh, light, crisp, clean, yeah. dry. Great with seafood. Refreshing. What? I, so here's what I love about Rioja is in it depends on the area that it's coming from. So first let's talk about the area. So you've got okay. Rioja Alta, yep. which is... S- if you if you think of Rioja as being maybe like a rec, like a rectangle, right? Mm-hmm. Would you call that a rectangle? Yeah, it's like an oblong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah. It anyway, looks... so if you cut it in half, Rioja Alta's on the top, Rioja Baja's on the bottom, and then kind of at the top top of Rioja Alta, pardon me, is um, Rioja Alavesa. And so in Rioja Alta, you have the temperatures are much cooler. Elevation is about 300 meters higher than Baja. Uh, so because this elevation is where it's at, you get cooler temperatures. Um, the wines for me here tend to have a little bit more tannin and a little bit more acidity than Baja, which makes them a wee bit more elegant now. And here's where it gets interesting is the soil really makes a difference in Spain a lot. I mean, it makes a difference everywhere, but <laughs> it's in a big Sp- deal in Spain. Right, because it's the same grape, but it's it, like depending on elevation or depending on how far away you are from mm-hmm. water or depending on... Right, 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 right. That the grape can express it much differently. Yeah, and so the soils in certain areas of Rioja Alta are a lot of... They have a lot of iron oxide, which is going to give a different red hue because of a proportion of of the soil which is clay that has this iron oxide in it yeah so if you move then kind of up to the top of Rioja Alta you have Rioja Alavesa um, which is northeast-ish of the area so you have a lot more hills um, better vineyards have south-facing slopes it's between Alta and Alavesa you have much more um it's just hillier it's not as mountainous Mm, mm. so then if you go down to baja you have vineyards that are much more flat right it's not quite as hilly Mm -hmm. it's um closer to the river the soils are a little bit more um stones from ancient floods wines from this area tend to be a wee bit more fruit forward they're not quite as as austere um, and newer wineries in the area are kind of focusing on a richer style, which we'll get to because it has to do with oak. Oh, yeah, for sure. In Spain, they really, really love American oak. Oh. And you're seeing a, you're seeing kind of a... Uh, <laughs> why the heavy sigh? Well, I have thoughts. Okay. And a bottle of wine that's open. We have two bottles of wine that are open because why is that? You always take two bottles. Always take two bottles. Absolutely. I have thoughts about this. American oak. 
American no. It goes really well with some grapes. It like accentuates the flavor and masks things in the grapes that perhaps shouldn't be expressed. And I think that my personal opinion is that it pairs very nicely with a Tempranillo. But American oak tastes like toasted coconut, which is not a favorite food group of mine. However, with the flavor of the Tempranillo, it really brings out um, the fruit of it rather uh-huh. than like rather than the coconut. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. It's so complimentary that you don't get this big like coconut bomb in your mouth. You get right. the expression of the fruit of, of the grape you know, that is made into the wine. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That makes Those sense. Those are my thoughts. I'm glad that it made sense. <laughs> I'm with you on this journey. <laughs> I'm glad that it made sense because sometimes I'm like, I have thoughts, but putting those into words, that's another, yeah, that's another, another thing. I, I get you. I'm picking it up, what you're putting we down. We can go into oak after, uh, like in a little bit, but it's mostly, Rioja's mostly made out of Tempranillo, right? Yeah. And so that can change depending on what you're doing and what level you're going into. Now, your Grand Reserva, I don't know, but this other one we've got from 2011, which is also Grand Reserva, um, lists it on the back. And so on the back of this one, it's 85% Tempranillo, 10% uh, Graciano, and 5% Mazuelo. And this is Campo Viejo. We have their sparkling. We've had their sparkling. We met them and tasted their wines at the Vancouver International oh, Wine Festival. Nicest people. Amazing, amazing people. Very, very nice um, wines. And that's why I picked this one up today. I wanted to celebrate a little bit with people that we know, producers that we've experienced yep. before. Yep, for sure. For Speaking sure. of experiencing, um, I <laughs> you need to experience more of this wine. This O5, this O5 is so... Well, Good. we can't drink it all. We do have dinner later. I'm an adult. I can do whatever I want. I mean, I'm not here to stop you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I might go head to head with the Campo Viejo. I, I, let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Let's make it, make it so, number one. So, since we're going to start talking about oak, let's just start very basically. The more oak Rioja sees the higher the quality level. So the grape Tempranillo Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, you're fine. The grape Tempranillo is expressed better it like it expresses as wine better the more time it sits. Yes. So for example, these are both Grand Reservas. I think we've talked about where we touched on this before. This is the highest quality level of Tempranillo you can get. So if you start with just basic Rioja, yeah, um, little to no oak, uh-huh. generally about one to two years of aging, it's going to run you mm, nine to twelve bucks. Y- yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was looking for my phone so I could take a picture of the color difference. But we're recording. Hi. Oh, hey, it's <laughs> over there. I was like, where'd my phone go? I'm looking all over for it, and but it's sitting up. It, we're recording. Yeah, it, it can see you. <laughs> Don't worry. It's not going to run away. I was going to take a picture of the color change. I also in. have the ability to take a picture. Oh, yeah. Can I steal your phone? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Awesome. Okay, so we have Rioja, and then next up is Crianza. Now that's going to see a year in oak and a year in the bottle. Generally going to run you 12 to 19 bucks. You then move up another level and you have Reserva that's going to see a year in oak and two years in the bottle, generally going to run you $25 or more. Now, here's where it gets real fancy. Grand Reserva sees two years in oak and three years in the bottle before it gets released. That's going to be generally $35 and up. Okay. So this Campo Viejo I got for $25. It was on sale at QFC. Uh huh. You can find some delicious Spanish wines at your grocery store. And honestly, if you're going to be stuck in a gas station, Spanish wine is a good way to go if you want something that's inexpensive and delicious and isn't going to be like a gross, sweet fruit bomb. Yeah, this is a 2011. Get yourself a Spanish something something. Oh, that's good. You can definitely taste the difference. Oh, is can... this one mine? Yeah. It's I, I different. like the other one better. <laughs> I like this one better. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's been in the cellar for much longer. Well, okay, so now we've talked about those levels. Let's talk about the grape itself. So Rioja mm-hmm. grows 
some amazing Tempranillo and it's <laughs> do you want to guess how many names Tempranillo has like a real guess I mean sure 325 no that's not that it's not that terrible 17 um let's see if I can find the actual 32 <laughs> are you ready yeah. for the list yeah is it <coughs> is it <laughs> <laughs> Let me wet my whistle first because <laughs> this list is long. Is it? How many are there? It doesn't give the total. It just sh- shows you. Oh, dear Lord. Tempranillo uh-huh. is known by other names in certain regions. These include, but not limited to. I have socks on. Okay. Ready to go. I hope so. Yeah. Albio Negro. Aldepeneas. Aragon, Aragonese, Aragonez, Aragonez 51, uh, 51, counting in Spanish, <laughs> it's not easy <laughs> for me when you get up to numbers past about 25, uh, Aragonas La Fera, Aragonas de Elvas, Arganda, Arinto Tinto, Sensibel, Sensibera, Chinchiana, Chinchiano, Chinchiviano, Cupani, De Porac. I'm, it's just, it, the list just literally goes on and on and on and on and on. That's and crazy. some of them are differentials of like Tinta de Pai, Tinta Fina, Tinta Madrid, Tinta Montanera, Tinta Montanero, Tinta Roriz, Tinta it's Roriz like, with a Z, Tinta it's Santiago. Like differences in inflection based yeah, on the same. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that Tempranillo is very, very adaptable. Like it can change drastically when you move it places. It's easily mutatable, it likes to do its own thing. It's it, um, it's real hardy. It doesn't it kind of grow it, like it can kind of grow anywhere, right? For sure, for sure. And so it can tend to be susceptible to rot, which is one of its oh. only kind of big downfalls. Um, if it's not breezy, mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. It's grown in Portugal, where it's got a ton of synon- synonymous names. It's used in certain types of port. It's used in red wines there. I mean, it grows on the Iberian Peninsula for a reason. Like, it just does well. Yeah. Um, it is named after a diminutive of the Spanish temprano, which means early. And it, that's a reference to the fact that it ripens generally weeks earlier than other things that are grown in Spain. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So it's been grown on the Iberian Peninsula since the time of the Phoenicians, who were a seafaring folk that kind of sort of took over. Mm-hmm. Long, 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 long time ago. And, you know, it's the main grape we see in Rioja, uh, generally referred to as Spain's noble grape. So Cab, Merlot, Chardonnay, Pinot, they're considered noble varietals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, And it has been planted all over the world, Mexico, New Zealand, California, Washington State, Oregon, South Africa, Texas, Australia, Argentina, Portugal, Uruguay, Turkey, Canada, Israel, and Arizona. (laughs) <laughs> is that where all those um great red wines are coming out of probably i think we talked about it on an episode that was like a singer from a famous band has a winery in arizona isn't he from tool new mexico i think so i think his name is maynard and he was the every time i hear that name it just makes me think of the bar in pioneer square <laughs> <laughs> yeah he has like i think we uh on one of our episodes, we looked for one of his bottles of wine to... to was it a, when we did the Southwest, right? Yeah, I think so. Anyway. But the bottles are like 65 Yeah, bucks. And they're pretty pricey. Tempranillo is actually the third most widely planted grape in the world. Behind Cabernet Sauvignon and, and Merlot. Merlot, which is what we talked about. Now, when this article was written, it was the third most planted grape. Things can change in the wine world on a whim. As we are, are all quite aware of. <laughs> Literally. Story of my life. <laughs> on a breeze. <laughs> um, it's, and that was, so that was in 2015. Okay. There were worldwide uh, 231,000 hectares, which breaks down to about 570,000, 570,000 um, acres, which is about 
88% of that in Spain alone. Out of wow. all of that, most of it is in Spain. That's crazy. Yeah, it's bananas. So, <laughs> not a super aromatic varietal. It is like Cab or Sangiovese or Pinot. Tempranillo has a pretty neutral flavor profile. Um, which is why you tend to see it blended with Grenache and Carignan. No, which all okay. So when I was and reading this the American stuff, oak. well, we'll get to that in a second because okay. there's a whole history, really, and a story, and a, you love a story. Fantastic! I can't wait. Um. So in Rioja, Carignan is known as Manzuelo. Uh, when you age it in oak for long periods of time, they tend to take on a lot of flavors of the barrel. Varietal examples usually have flavors of plum and strawberries pardon me tempranillo is early ripening varietal um it does really well if your vineyard is kind of chalky and like those in Riviera de duero uh where it is known as tinto roris or aragonez um generally blended um in portugal with those those two names um in port like i said yeah so, tinto roris is used a lot in port for sure and that's just tempranillo so for a long time, it was thought to be related to Pinot Noir. Um, and according to legend, which we all know don't tend to be. It's like the internet. Everything the truth. is true. No, it's not. <laughs> that is a fib and a falsehood. You were okay. leading the children astray. <laughs> don't believe everything that you hear or read. But listen to everything we have to say because yeah. it's important. It is important. And then do your own homework because <laughs> we don't know either. Hey, the internet okay. is large and has some dark, scary corners. Yeah, we travel to those edges sometimes just for you hey we're doing the lord's work <laughs> so so the le legend has it <laughs> thank you keep me on track <laughs> that uh cistercian monks actually left pinot noir cuttings at monasteries along the pilgrimage of the santiago de compostela which is a big which is what we're gonna do oh someday it's on my it's probably just gonna be you and me because my husband won't come that's fine that's fine <laughs> i have to like do a time out here because <laughs> you called me today and you never call me no we're always texting but we're i was driving texting. and i believe in safety first yeah so you're like call amanda my phone rings and, and for says, the record i didn't have my phone in like i said call amanda and the phone called amanda right like it's not i wasn't yeah driving and tapping Ta right so my phone rings and i was like huh weird i never get phone calls people text and it says brandon traveling and wine bro <laughs> I'm not a bro. <laughs> well, like brother. Be, be right. it, that's yeah, all yeah. that showed up you. on my screen. And I was just, I died laughing. I thought that was so funny. That's hilarious. So we are definitely going to do this the Spanish Santiago walk. Santiago de Compostela. Yeah. So now studies have shown that there's actually no genetic connection between Pinot and Tempranillo. Spanish cultivation, uh, the common ancestor of almost all vines today, Vitis vinifera. Mm-hmm which was brought over by the Phoenician settlement in the southern provinces. Later, according to the Roman writer Columella, wines were grown all over Spain, yet there were only scattered references to the name Tempranillo. Rubiera del Duero wines uh, make up, uh, they go back about 2,000 years. Wow. Um, and there's evidence of a 66-meter mosaic of Bacchus, the Roman wine god that mm -hmm. was unearthed in 1972 in the Baños de Valdorados. So... What this means is that it's possible that the grape was introduced to the Western Hemisphere by Spanish conquistadors in the 17th century, as well as um, different varietals that ended up in Argentina that have a really close genetic relationship with Tempranillo, mm -hmm. rather than to a small handful of other European varietals against which Criolla varietals were tested. Now, despite its apparent fragility, Tempranillo actually ended up traveling everywhere during the 20th century. And after a lot of, will it work here? Can we plant it here? Is it going to thrive? Is it not trial and error? Like experimentation. Yeah. It really became established in, um, around 1905, uh, Frederick Bialetti brought Tempranillo to California where it received, um, kind of a thumbs down reception. Mm -hmm. Um, probably because of prohibition was creeping up on us. Um, and also because uh, the grapes dislike of hot, dry climates. It was much later throughout the 1980s that Californian Tempranillo uh, actually started to sort of thrive following the establishment of um, kind of hillier mountainous sites. I have two things for you. I have 10 hundred things for you. <laughs> Just my love. One, 
Uh, I heard an internet rumor that Rioja really got its um, name and popularity when the French were devastated by phylloxera. Oh, it's in my five facts of Rioja that you oh, need really? to know. Okay, we'll do that later. The second thing, because we'll go over it later. The second thing that I had a question on is, do you think that the popularity of Tempranillo as a grape didn't really take off in the States because we like using French oak and it doesn't express the grape as well as an American oak? No, oh. I don't. And we'll get into why I think that when we talk about how oak from America was influenced in Spain and why that is and how it's sort of in decline. Oh, really? Well, funny enough, I think oak is next on our list. Oh, that is a true statement. <laughs> so we're going to run through a quick history of American oak because it can get real convoluted. And we're still going to go to a cooperage. Oh, can we please? Yeah, absolutely. Like, I want to burn a barrel. <laughs> it's it's really hard to um, plan travel because our schedules, obviously, but we it's on the list. We are definitely going to do this. There's one in Oregon. Yeah, it's not too far. Let's fucking road trip, man. I know. Why can't we just be independently wealthy and travel and drink wine for a living? (laughs) Hey, sign up on Patreon so that we can travel and drink wine for a living. (laughs) (laughs) Or maybe just, you know, pay for equipment. (laughs) Baby steps. Baby steps. Baby steps. All right. American Oak. Picture it. Picture it. I almost said Sicily, 1928, but that's a Golden Girls reference. (laughs) (laughs) Not a Rioja reference. No, I wish it were. It is not. Um, So Picture it. What people don't often realize is that just as recently as the 1900s, the barrel, like a a barrel, was the most popular container in the world. Right, because you can there was ship no plastic. Everything in a barrel. Everything. And glass was very difficult to make. Mm-hmm. And barrels. Heavy. Glass was very heavy. You and know, it broke. Yep. Barrels, sturdy as fuck. Yep. Like my moral constitution. <laughs> Just kidding. It's easily swayed. Um, barrels were the thing that you moved, moved liquid and yeah. what have you in. And so today, outside of primarily Tabasco, uh, Barrels are mostly used in the production of alcoholic beverages. Yeah. I Whiskey, can't think of anything sherry, else. Sherry. Wine. Wine. Bourbon. Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't think of anything else that uses barrels yeah, as extensively yeah. as the alcohol industry. Yeah. So you just see barrels used for small goods and liquids around the turn of the 20th century. Um and had really just been used for about the last 2000 years. So earlier records are murky, but the barrel as we know it now, which is let's just break that down. Multiple pieces of wood bent into shape by fire. Mm-hmm. Um, look up like YouTube, the, a cooperage. It's amazing. It's so fascinating. And they put a piece of metal over the top mm-hmm. of it and they like do it's all, all the things. hammering and there's, you know, just metal and wood and, and hammers <laughs> and fire what else do you need in life safety third well i mean yeah what happens sorry we're just, we <laughs> we're recording and then and then no and, and then, then no, no capes no capes and then so Early <laughs> records, let's get back on track. Uh, multiple pieces of wood, bent into shape by fire, is thought to have been invented actually by the Spanish Celts sometime around the 5th century BC. Um, it was then adopted and spread by a variety of forces, including the Romans, colonizing Europeans, motherfuckers. And, uh, <laughs> Easy. <laughs> colonizers, it's not acceptable. Oh, yeah. I thought you were... You're European. I'm European. That doesn't make it right. Agreed. <laughs> it's not not okay. Unacceptable mm-hmm. for 500, Alex. Um. Okay. So the barrel's importance grew and grew and grew as it's spread based on a lot of these things. It was used for oil, ammunition, food stuff, building materials, Everything. currency, all manner you could of beverages. Stack it. You could roll it. You yep. could put it on a ship. You could put it on the. You know uh, what? Are, what are those called? Wagon. Put it on a wagon. Or a boat. Or a donkey, or a around the neck of a Saint Bernard if you're in the mountains. <laughs> Am I wrong? Well, kind of. I don't think that Saint Bernards actually carried 
barrels, but that's no, okay. on their around their neck. They had like booze in them when they went and saved people. That's I what think, the cartoons taught me. Yeah, I think that that's a legend. <laughs> it's, it's I read it on the internet. It must be true. Um, so it wasn't really until the advent of cardboard, plastic, and stainless steel during the 19th and 20th centuries that it really kind of didn't continue to be the thing it was. Barrels. Barrels. Okay. Um, and it essentially was relegated to cellars, caves, and barns um, of the wine and spirits industry. So when the American wine industry actually started getting its boom at the later end of the 19th century, a lot of the wood actually was either redwood, which had the benefit of growing on the West Coast. Oh, yeah, because California. Or American white oak, which had to be shipped across the country from eastern forests. So you see a lot of that oak in like Kentucky and and all of those places where brown booze comes from. Yep. Now, larger format vessels were much more common and a handful of the wider, more widely traveled producers like Behringer brought in a lot of European oak ovals for their own use american oak barrels um were even being exported at that time most notably to spain now lopez de heredia uh actually was solely reliant on american oak from their first vintage in 1877 and they said this oak was available Mm -hmm. and it was well priced oh okay it was cheap and we could get it great done uh by the early 1900s however a lot of advances in you know science in terms of inventing plastic and stainless steel and you know all the things cardboard yeah um really kind of crippled the american cooperage industry and then prohibition happened and you Fucked know us. put your morals before people's jobs and then what happens yeah well cooper coopers Coop- cooperages cooperages cooper I don't know. The people who make the barrels. Those people. They're very important. They are very important. Um, Essentially get out of jobs. So, or lose their jobs, essentially, thanks to prohibition. So things end up picking up uh, pretty quickly after the repeal of prohibition, mostly because of spirits. And then in 1935, the Federal Alcohol Administration Act mandated that anything labeled bourbon yep. had to be aged in new oak. The wine industry, however, was much slower to fix itself. So you saw in they call them the wet decades after prohibition, where most wineries actually continued their pre prohibition on using larger format vessels, often older. um, While there were a few people who started to use smaller oak for aging, typically um, things like the size that you would use for bourbon. So um, Tim Mondavi actually remembers his days at Charles Krug and said, we would buy used whiskey barrels, rinse them out and fill them with wine. This is certainly crude by today's standards, but the wines actually aged in those barrels tend to have an interesting quality develop over time. Well, yeah, I would imagine so. And we're going to skip a bunch of stuff because it's not that important, but it will be posted on Patreon. If you want to, I'm just reading the highlighted bits. (laughs) So, Quality across the board today is actually much better than it used to be. And some producers actually have always been able to attain a really high level of product by working really closely with their coopers. Um, Paul Draper of Ridge has been particularly hands-on and has advised dozens of American cooperages since uh, starting at Ridge in 1969. Um, For decades, he traveled widely over Missouri and Kentucky, really building relationships with people and because of all this intimacy and these relationships, he was able to personally select the staves, which are the individual Pieces. portions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, essentially picking the best for himself. So there was one now defunct Cooper even promised him that he wouldn't let his team work on the Ridge barrels on Mondays, lest they still be wobbly from the weekend. How interesting. I have a question for you. I have answers. It's so interesting. Uh, my question is, during prohibition there was not many cooper coopers cooperages Mm -hmm. people who were making barrels right Mm -hmm. because it was used in the alcohol industry which we didn't have right my question is there's so many things in our world right now that are changing right people had to at some point after prohibition relearn how to make barrels 
right or their grandfather had yeah. to teach like yeah it, yeah yeah it wasn't just this oh well i had a cooperage and now i'm just gonna fire things back up again because it was quite a while prohibition lasted quite a while too long in my opinion <laughs> my uh, my question is and this is just an opinion question is what what do you think is like that in today's modern era oh right like there's some th- there's got to be things that we are losing in this move towards technology and this move to, right there's things that um like you know how to can not everybody knows how to can Oh, because I'm a little old man who just wants to stay home and make pickled vegetables. Right. But there's people that don't, that know how to sew. And that's like a specialty thing. Now, not everybody like there was a time when everyone knew how to sew. Well, and I feel like a lot of that has to do with everything being accessible at all times. Grocery stores, you don't have the local market that everybody goes to in town right now. You yeah. have multiple grocery stores that sell a lot of things as opposed to oh, I'm going to go and pick some pickles up and I want a, a bag of flour and I need, a you know, a bolt of... A grocery list of A bolt of um, fabric because I have to make my own clothes yeah. or... You and you know. all got that at, in... You got it at the same place, all those things at the same place, which was also the post office, which was also, you know, yeah. the school, yeah. maybe. I mean, sometimes it still is. Yeah, I guess so. It's just... Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of if there's another industry outside of being a cooper or making barrels, right? That ex- essentially didn't exist in the United States for a while. Um, uh, and then people had to relearn it and then businesses had to start again. I'm just, you know, it's just one of those like, huh, you always learn from history. What What is this piece that I can learn? Right, right. Well, I think you're seeing that with Stelvin screw top closures on wine. Oh. You're seeing that with uh, just in terms of advancement, you're seeing that with um, things that are going in bag in a box, right? The quality yeah. is still there, and pe- we're fighting this this mentality of oh, that means it's cheap because that's what it was for such a long time, and that's yep. been ingrained in us. And it's yep. been for me as a as a sales rep, it's been hard to convince people that it's it's actually legit. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. It doesn't. Always now, Rio has a different story because it definitely benefits from living in a bottle, and and there are mandates about what you can and can't call a thing based on how you age it and what you're aging yep. it in. Yep. And there's a whole like conversation about cork, right? There's a whole conversation that we haven't even touched on about cork and what the difference. You know, where does it come from? Is there a difference between actual cork or synthetic cork, or you know? Oh, absolutely. It's Maybe. it's just an interest it's interesting to watch a lot of the things in this industry adapt mm-hmm. or die. Mm-hmm. Like just because we've been doing it this way for 2000 years, Maybe not the best way. Maybe not what it was 2000 years ago. Right, because it was the only way. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had one option. Yeah. You had one job, Rioja. <laughs> One job, <laughs> and you're still doing it because it's delicious. Yeah, I didn't mean to derail you, but I was just, you know, it's those questions that fascinate me. Like, people had to relearn how to make barrels at some point in the United States. Well, and then when things ramped up again. Okay, so here's the thing: we had to redefine laws in every yeah, state in because every state. You know, states' rights, and that's yep. what we're all about. And then you see places, and even you get into counties' rights. Yep. We don't drink in this county on Sundays. Booze is not a... Li- we're dry. It's a dry county. I would be just... Ugh. No, thanks. Not into that at all. Yeah. Well, you know what? You're passionate about wine, and I bet that you would change things. <laughs> and I know. Mostly because those dry counties are in landlocked square states that I have no business being in. Yeah, that's true. Thank God for the ocean. Short, sassy hobbit me, and, you know... Mm-hmm. I love you, Brandon. You're beautiful <laughs> the way you are. I just know Don't that I change. I just I, I won't. <laughs> Don't you worry. I've been this sassy for years. What makes you think I'm going to stop now? Um, okay, so let's get back to Oak for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, now, one of the biggest historical foreign markets for Oak is still Spain and coincidentally Australia. 
Really? Yeah. So markets that surprises are me. constantly in flux, right? You've got tariffs, you've got laws, you've got shortages, you've got shipping yep. situations, yep. you've got fucking typhoons and monsoons and hurricanes and presidents and sea monsters <laughs> and, you know, Cthulhu. Yeah. Also true. Some might say a god. Some would could be wrong. You don't know. You never know. Um, I'm not one to judge. <laughs> much. Except for when I'm drinking. <laughs> um, so you saw sort of this generational change and shifts in how vintners and winemakers made their barrel selections. So Spain has been growing wine forever and, you know, almost as long as everywhere else in Europe. Well, yeah. When you talk about the Phoenicians and you talk like... Span this this span Sp- Spain the Spaniards they I mean they're like the French they're like the Italians they have they have wine with dinner they have wine with lunch they have like this is oh, a part yeah, of the for sure, culture for sure is wine yes. well it, Spain kind of lagged behind in terms of um, advancement in the wine world until about the middle of the 19th century so in the 1850s and 60s you had this like double sided assault of phylloxera yep in France. Right? Just in general. In general. For uh, Vitis vinifera. Mm -hmm. Yep. And oidium. So this was all happening in France, wreaking havoc. It was just, it destroyed everything. Mm -hmm. So what happened is it prompted French merchants and winemakers to investigate Spain as a potential source of wine. Like, where can we get grapes from? Because we have nothing to use. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, what ended up happening was kind of an interesting intellectual exchange between Bordeaux and Rioja that really started modernizing the more rustic way of doing things that Spain had been doing for such a long time. Mm -hmm. So one of the big important introductions um, from Bordeaux made to Spain was the practice of cask aging. Oh, in a barrel. Mm -hmm. How interesting. Instead of using French or Eastern European oak, however, the Spanish took advantage of their well-established trade routes with America and embraced Q. alba, which is the varietal of oak that is grown in the United States, Mm -hmm. as their wood of choice. So because of this, Rioja is one of Spain's most historic wine regions and has the longest and most intimate association with American oak. Um, More recently established areas of production like Ribiera Duero or Priorat, American oak is not as widely found. So it's not as influential all over Spain. So this mostly is mostly in Rioja. So interesting because Spain has had this long standing relationship with America in regards to oak and mm-hmm. wine production. And Spain has this interesting history with France in regards to Bordeaux teaching them how to use oak on their wines. Right. And we talked a few months ago about how the Spanish are bringing wine over into France and they're, <laughs> they're talking about. I mean, they're saying it's bottled in France, but it's actually Spanish wine, and it was it's this whole thing. Oh, it's a whole to do in terms of. So it's it they're taxes working together in terms of name, in terms so of crazy. labeling, and it's yeah. it is a it is very interesting. It is very well, interesting. Well, it goes back to this thing: why things that are regulated are regulated by a syndicate. And I looked up the definition of a syndicate. Oh, by the God. way, <laughs> Jesus, it's just a group of people that create regulation around what you know, like a common goal like so the mob no it could be like the mob anything mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well josh reynolds who is formerly of stephen tanzer's international wine cellar uh-huh. um had been reviewing wines from spain and australia for when this article came out 12 years okay and he had said you see american oak mostly in rioja although it is also in toro jumila and yekla uh, most of it is used to age Tempranillo, although some of Spain's most lauded brands utilize the l- really a lot of American oak. So Lopez de Heredia, he- Heredia um, who we've talked about as used American mm-hmm. oak for about mm-hmm. 140 years, doesn't plan to change. There are other places that have been using oak nearly as long. Uh, there's one gentleman who is using about 50% American oak, which is down from what they used about 30 years ago. So weren't they using like 80% or so? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So you see Spain is still has a massive market for American oak. The numbers have been decreasing incrementally every year. And part of that has to move, has to do with this shift to be part of a larger international movement 
to really focus on elegance rather than power mm. in wine. And there is a difference in, in the oak that you use to age your wine. French oak and Hungarian oak are not the same. No. Amer- just because they're oak trees doesn't mean they're the same species. Nope. Mm-mm. It's just like wine. For, uh, not species. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, <laughs> family, genus, species. But there's one more like underneath that varietal, I guess, is the word I'm thinking of. All right. So like vin- uh, Vitis vinifera versus Vitis lambrusca? Or, or are or you Or talking- Reparis or... Got it. Yeah. All these different things. Hey, man. Grapes. It's so crazy. It's... it's I love it, but yeah. it's so amazing. Yeah. It's... It is interesting. Let's talk some facts about Rioja. Fun facts or regular facts? Oh, of course they're fun facts. <laughs> Everything we do is fun facts. Fluid facts? So... I don't think they're fluid. I think these are like... They're legit facts. I think they're totes legit skis. Okay. Cited. Cite your sources. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's important. I love it. Um, so it's not all... Fact number one. Fact one. It is not all about Tempranillo. Okay. When you say Rioja, people think about the Tempranillo grape, and for good reason. It compromises a majority of the blend. Most Rioja wines are often... 100% Tempranillo. Yeah, right. Yeah. Speaking of, I could use a sip. I'm getting parched. Um, now, it also gives Rioja this distinctive um, Oh, I just lost my spot. There's a microphone in my face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> distinctive aromas, aromas of dried fruits and mellower spices that a lot of people really love about Rioja. Mm-hmm. Um Tempranillo is synonymous with the region since about the mid 15th century uh, and is mostly the most popular grape planted now. Yeah, right. Of course. There are other red grapes that are prominent. Rioja Garnacha, which is Grenache, yep. Graciano, and Manzuelo, which we've also talked about is Carignan. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that the laws that regulate the designation of Rioja DOC on a label allow for any use of any of these grapes in any percentage. As an example. You could have 100% Carmenere as a Rioja. No, no, no. Did I list Carmenere? Oh, no. Grenache. Yes. Sorry. (laughs) You were thinking Carignan. (laughs) I was thinking Carignan. Yeah. (laughs) That's a different episode. Carmenere comes later. Carmenere comes later. Um, So you, for example, in Rio Madre Rioja, you can make it from 100% Graciano and it's delicious and has a 90 point score from the wine advocate. Huh. Yeah. Fact number two. (laughs) Fact number two. Um, Like we already talked about Rioja or's boat, Rioja O's Bordeaux in a very large way. Yeah. I mean, if somebody tells you how to make your wine just a little bit better. Yeah. So in 1780, when Don Man- Don Manuel Quintano traveled to Bordeaux to learn how to make fine wine, he returned to Spain essentially with a magic bullet of sorts. A new tool in Bordeaux, which was the oak barrel. Now, it helped in quality, but also allowed for the idea of exploration to become a major factor in Rioja, essentially developing markets as far away as Cuba. And since the wines of Rioja stayed intact during travel, they were kind of better than French wine. Well, yeah, because they're, yeah. So in another instance of Bordeaux helping Rioja become what it is known as today, during the 19th century, as vineyards across France, including Bordeaux, were perishing because of phylloxera, which we've talked about, uh, the Bordelais, which are the people of Bordeaux, never stopped drinking or shipping wine. So to quench their thirst and demands for their customers in the capitals of Europe, they often turned to their old friend of the South, Rioja, in turn helping to bring the wines of Rioja to the world stage in Paris, London, and beyond. Hey, wine touches all corners of everybody's life. And mouth. Mm. (laughs) Fact number three. Most Rioja are rarely labeled as such in a specific subregion. So what does this mean? That there are three subregions in Rioja, which we've talked about, Rioja Alta, uh, Rioja Rioja Alavesa, and Rioja Baja. 
um, which is much drier and warmer and more Mediterranean producing wines of ripeness and power. Now, because most wineries do not have land holdings in multiple subregions, the wines of a particular producer will often consistently show characteristics of their subregion. Combine that with the fact that you use any of the four main grapes in any percentage, you will end up with a rel- with the reality that there is a huge variation in style and possibilities in Rioja. So it can get really varied varied it can as we've tasted this evening oh for sure these two wines are not and granted they're many many years apart mm-hmm. and not like each other at all uh-uh. nope at all nope not in flavor not in texture not in smell not in anything How right interesting. i was looking to see if it came from a location um but i couldn't see anything because also <laughs> no glasses. Okay, fact number four. Rioja is a geology and terroir lover's dream. And I've got photos up of all oh, of yeah. these Oh, yeah, we talked about it a little bit early. Uh, early, in, early Look at earlier. this. Look at this. Oh, yeah. Practically sand, practically solid rock, red dirt. Right, That's it, crazy. It's, yeah, y'all you'll, you'll have to take a look at these, at these photos that I'll Pictures have. are on Patreon. It's helpful. I'm a visual learner. Uh, okay. So rarely do you come across a wine region with distinctive yet varied geologies like Rioja. As you can see from the photos below, if you're a Patreon member. Um, <laughs> Sign up today. A lot of areas in Rioja look like very famous places around the world that grapes grow. Chateau Neuf du Pop, Cunawara, uh, Cotra Costa. Essentially, these are areas that are very defined based on their soil. Yeah, yeah. All right, number five. Number five. Rio. Here's the thing that totally blew my mind. Oh, Rioja mm-hmm. can stop producing wine today and yet continue to keep the pipeline full for years and years. There is no region outside of possibly Champagne where wines are stored in such quantity as Rioja. And because Rioja wines are labeled based on minimum aging laws, like we talked about earlier. Yep. Like Champagne. Champagne is labeled yep. mm-hmm. on aging. and Yep. Yep. A natural backlog of wine supply develops. For instance, to be labeled Reserva, a red Rioja has to meet a minimum of one year in oak and two years in the bottle. Many producers go above and beyond these minimum requirements and yep. have held on to wine for five, 10, or even 20 years before releasing them to the world. As a result, most producers could cease production today, yet easily keep all of their customers supplied for three to four years. Well, this, I mean, this wine that we're drinking is 13 years old and I just bought it this year. Yeah. So they've held on to it yeah. for this long yeah. and it is damn delicious. Yep. It's so, it's so crazy. That it's is so crazy. Amazing. Those that are my five amazing. facts. Wait, one more. We have a bonus fact. Oh, the well, gold wire. It's not really a bonus fact. It's more of a fun kind of weird story. So if you've ever purchased Rioja and you've noticed that it has this like, like gold. gold wire wrapped yeah. around it. I'll take a picture of what we have. I took one off. Oh, cool. Awesome. I mean, I'll take a picture of that you one. You can't too. really see it, yeah. but you know, <laughs> story of my life. <laughs> so what this has to do with Here's what we'll, where we will wrap up today. So for a long time, some wines have just been better than others. And some yeah. wines have been more well received because they're just better in quality. Mm-hmm or they're more desirable or collectible or whatever. And counterfeiting tends to be a problem. Yeah. That we, which we've talked about counterfeiting is a big problem. In oh, the wine I need industry. to read that book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so just like art or fashion, people will go to very great lengths to be able to get a believable copy of something that people will pay for. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Now, at the same time, those that make collectible goods will go to great lengths in order to stop those people making counterfeit copies. Right, which we talked about the scanning thing and the DNA and the XYZ, XYZ. Yep. Yep. So mm-hmm. today we have microchips and scannable barcodes to help maintain a wine's true origin. Also ink in labels. Also, I mean, there's a lot of things. Yeah. Listen to the episode. Um <laughs> Often that isn't enough to stop someone who's a very good counterfeiter, as we've as talked we've about. talked about. Yeah. Now, in the time of pre-tech wine world, a lot of people were kind of left to their own devices and kind of had to just make up how the fuck are we going to like protect our beverage, protect our wine, and they, so this gold thi- this gold wrap was their way. Well, 
we'll get there. Oh, sorry. so I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> just like in art, when a, a winemaker doesn't get any additional profit if their bottle continues to essentially get more expensive, right? So something from Chateau Neuf du Pop from 50 years ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Someone bought that for whatever, let's say, for the sake of saying $30. Yeah. That's not true, but I just picked a number. In 1970, whatever. Yeah. Now, what the price of that thing has gone up, but that original sale or whoever made that wine is not seeing that increase in money from that previously sold. The $35 bottle that they they only got the, the... the winemaker only got the $35. It's been sitting in somebody's cellar for the last 30 years or whatever. Right. Rising in value, rising in need. Yep. So Wine is currency. You had dot a, com. For, <laughs> it shouldn't be, but it is. Yeah. Um, now, the motivation for protecting the wine's integrity was instead of self-preservation, because if you happen to drink a bottle of what you thought was a particular wine that instead was counterfeit, the results could be really bad for your wine's reputation. Yeah. You know, and so a winemaker had nothing to do with whatever happened after it leaves their establishment, right? So yeah, yeah, that's a problem. That's true. Now, here's where we get to this whole origin of the traditional gold wire netting that can be found around surrounding bottles of high-end Rioja. In 1858, Camilo Hurat- Hur- Hurtado uh, de Amazaga, who was the Marquis de Riscal, and now, fun fact, the title Marquis de Riscal is a Spanish noble title created in 1708 uh, by King Philippe V uh, for Balthazar Hurtado de Amazaga, and since then only seven people have actually ever held the title. So this gentleman in 1858... In the, the middle of the French phylloxera issues. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, founded a winery in Rioja that he named after the title he was clearly very proud to hold, Marquez de Riscal. Prior to starting this winery, that's not it. Oh, I was like, oh my God, do we have wine? From- <laughs> I was. I looked earlier because I, I was, was like, this excited. might just <laughs> align with all the things. It doesn't. Um, so he starts this winery before that he had studied in Bordeaux and learned to make wines in the French tradition. When he Mm -hmm. returned to Spain, he sought to experiment with those French methods, making a wine that was the first to use French oak barrels during the aging process, which he borrowed from, from Bordeaux. Yep. So after releasing his wines using French methods, he started to just win awards left and right. And it wasn't long after receiving some of these awards that they became the preferred wine of King Alfonso the 12th of Spain of Spain okay so his wines were very desirable and very yeah. collectible and then the counterfeiting started so because uh, there was no French wine there was like so you had this finite amount of wine and he made really really good wine mm-hmm. I got it I'm mm-hmm. with you yeah of course so he wants to protect it it's yep. very precious to him mm-hmm he invents this wire netting that covered the bottle, thereby preventing counterfeiters from being able to just easily remove the cork, fill the bottle up, refill it, and put and it put back in. Yep. In the mid 1800s. Uh, this was in 1858. Yeah, eight, that's what I wrote down. Uh, so. That's amazing. Yeah, and since it was impossible to remove the netting without breaking it, and once off, the netting could not be put back on the bottle. As we know is very true. If there is something wrong with wrong with the wire netting surrounding the bottle, chances are the bottle is a fake. Oh, that's amazing. And you just see it on higher-end bottles of Rioja now. Mm-hmm. Or shit from Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> <laughs> or I mean, shit from Fan- Francis Ford. Yeah, you're not wrong. I know. In Rioja bottles, though. Right, it's but like it's, the it's Grand higher, Reserve. Yeah, it's higher thing. end fancy Rioja bottles. Um, so, this invention was such an ingenious success that a, a lot of other high quality Rioja producers started to follow suit. Uh, they also sought uh, to protect their precious wines with this essentially same system. In time, the use of the wire mesh was so ubiquitous that its presence on a bottle came to signify top quality Rioja. The gold wire became a symbol of prestige, and today the netting is still used by some bodegas, and though it is now just more about tradition than counterfeit production, that's why we have microchips. So it lives in a gilded cage. (laughs) 
I just <laughs> mic dropped just, with a piece of foil. <laughs> I was going to say, is that cork or fo- foil? It was foil. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> we'll let the cats play with it later. Perfect. Yeah. So that's what I have. I love it. Yeah. That's amazing. I think it's, I think Rioja is amazing. It's really approachable. It's not as, you know, bold structured as cab can be. It's no, softer it's, fruit. Very easy to drink as And you can lay it learned. down forever. <laughs> yeah, you can lay it down forever. Right. Everybody needs to buy a couple of bottles of Rioja and put it in their cellar, mm-hmm. in their, you know, under their bed, and just leave it there for a little bit. It is really good. Yeah. And thank you, Andrew. Valley Wine Merchants in Newburgh, Oregon. Go there. Buy all the wine. Yeah. Yeah. If you go down tasting in Oregon, make sure you stop there and say hi. He has a lot of really cool and interesting things that you won't find anywhere else. I should actually call him and be like, hey, Andrew, what do you want me to say about your (laughs) about your store? He doesn't sponsor us, but I I love him so much. It's one of those like, oh, you find someone who's who is doing a really great job and you want to support them. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, I buy a lot of my wine (laughs) over in West Seattle at bin 41 because. Oh, right. Yeah. It's a smaller selection, but it's all very meticulously and they are on point with their bubbles selection. Yes. If, you, uh, if you need bubbles and you're in the Seattle area, you had your ass to bin 41 because their bubbles are on point. It's good stuff. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. So that's what I have. That's it. Talked about some oak, talked about the levels, talked about some fun stories with the things. And how Rioja earned its gilded cage. Mm-hmm. And rightly so. Yeah. I have to say. Brandon, I love you. Hey, Amanda, I love you too. And everybody listening. We love you. You're pretty awesome. Thank you. And uh, always take two bottles. Yeah. that's. And we'll talk to you next week. Yeah. We love you. Tune in. Tune up. <laughs> pop a cork. <laughs> lay back in your pajamas. Yeah. Oh, God. Please drink all the things. And let us know and what let you're us know. drinking. Take a picture. Tag us on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we are on Twitter. Sometimes I'm terrible at Twitter because I get I fall well. into this like what terrible thing did someone say about someone else today and then the comments and it's I should just get rid of it. Yeah, I hate it. <laughs> it sucks me in or send us an email. Oh, that works, too. Yeah. If you want some swag, let us know. Yeah. We've All got right. Swag for days. We love you. Ciao. Bye bye.